Well, we're continuing with our series, Did He Just Say That? The theme of our, our series is 1 Timothy chapter 4, or 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come where they not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, they will have itching ears and heap on themselves teachers that will turn their ears away from the truth and aside to fables. But you be watchful yes. in all things. Endure afflictions, the work of the evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. See, the Western church has become a place where itching ears come to church to be told how great you are, how amazing you are. But how many know that we're nothing without our Heavenly Father. Amen. I don't want to come to church and be told how amazing I am. I want to come to church and be told that I am a Savior yes. that will strengthen me, that will empower me to live the life that He's yeah. called me to live that I can't do on my own. Right. You see, we're living in a world that has a voice. There's a loud voice on social media. There's a loud voice on the news. There's a loud voice in all of our schools public schools, colleges, universities. But for the most part, the church has been silent. How many know the church needs to be the loudest voice in our culture? Today I want to speak to you probably one of the most important messages because I believe if it sets the tone in your life, you won't look at your circumstances the same after today. I'm going to preach on the holiness of God. I feel like we haven't as a, as a church and maybe, maybe as society, we've undermined who God really is. Amen? We know about God. We know how amazing and majestic he is. But if we really knew who God was, would we fear all this stuff going on around us? As I was driving up to Edmonton on Wednesday to do the press conference that was, that was uh, heard around the world, I got calls and text messages telling me to cease and desist, people told me. <laughs> I, was, I was on some text, how many know this is really awkward? I was on some uh, group messages and I don't respond because they, they go all the time. So I'm on this group message, and people have forgotten that I'm on this group message. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's wonderful to, as we're getting close to the legislature, all these colorful things are being said about your pastor, and uh, that I was there to destroy Daniel Smith, and. Pastor Archer was there to destroy Daniel Smith. And I'm not going to go on long on that today. All I'm going to say is we are called to expose evil. Yeah. Yes. No matter where it is. Okay. If it's in the NDP, we're supposed to expose it in the NDP. If it's in the conservatives, we're supposed to expose it in the conservatives. It's what we're called to do. And the message that Pastor Archer spoke that day really had nothing different in it than what he's been speaking this last three years. But the criticism he has faced has been crazy from Christians. He's not a pastor. How can you call him a pastor? He doesn't preach God's word. He's hateful. He's all this stuff. And I want to just put them back. If you, I'm going to share my video of what I spoke a few weeks ago about how Jesus confronted evil. It seems like people just forget that when Jesus saw evil, he called people serpents and snakes and broads of vipers and sons of Satan, right? And so Pastor Archer hasn't changed, but I think the people around him have changed. And it's, it's really unfortunate 
But how many know that if one is with us, if two is with us, it doesn't matter. We have the Lord of Lords with us. And we're not going to back down. No matter who stands with us, it doesn't matter because we have the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's all we need on our side. I, we don't need a bunch of people. We have God on our side. That's all we need. Amen? So let's recognize who God is, the holiness of our God. Holiness is worship to our Savior, sacred, divine, consecrated, set apart. God has called us to live a holy life. God is holy and he has called us to be holy. 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. I got a ton of scripture today, so you might not be able to follow me. Probably more scripture than I've ever done. Um, so if you want the notes after the service, I can give them to you. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, we're called to be obedient, church. Not conforming yourselves to former lusts, as in your ignorance. But he who called you is holy. You are also to be holy in your conduct. Because it is written, be holy as I am holy. If it wasn't attainable to be holy, why would God ask us to do it? And I hear examples from Christians all the time. Well, if we can't live a perfect life, we can't, we can't be all that God wants us to be. It's impossible. I try, I try, I try. Well, that's your problem because it's in your striving and you're trying. It's not about you. It's about him. The more we focus on him and the more we ask that the Holy Spirit empowers us and guides us and leads us, then we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to strive to have a certain level with God. That's not what he's looking for. What he wants from us is our obedience. So I want to talk to you about the holiness of God. Can we really describe the greatness of our God? I want to tell you today, I feel completely and totally unqualified to preach about the holiness of God. Just mentioning the holiness of God, I get shivers going up my neck. Psalm 104, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out like a curtain. 2 Corinthians 3.17 Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, or there is freedom. Don't look for it in a government. The government has no way to tell you that you're free. You're not free in the government. You're free in Jesus Christ. Amen? It's a freedom like no other church. I love, I love my life. I can say whatever I want when I want. And, I, and people can't intimidate me. And you know what? You're a bigger threat to the kingdom of darkness when you can speak your mind respectfully and they can't shut you up. I always say the more they try to shut me up, the more I speak up. You think they would learn by now. And so I get all these nasty messages about how bad I am that I'm, st I'm preaching at the, you know, at the press conference. I gotta tell you something, like, did you guys see all the cameras in front? Like, there was a ton of news cameras. And I started, like, how many? 45 news stations. 45 news stations. And so I go up to the camera, and I'm not expecting to speak first. Archer says to me, hey, you're praying. And I go, of course I am. I'm always praying at all these press conferences. <laughs> so I literally walk into, I walk through the tunnel of all of our solidarity supporters, and all the cameras are there. And if any of you saw the, the prayer, I literally started rebuking demons right in front of the cameras. And as I'm, as I'm rebuking demons, some of the news broadcasters, their eyes started fluttering like this. 
And, and the one lady starts like playing with her chin like this. And she starts, Sarah goes, you look like you were going to make her cry. Wow. Like she's standing there and she's like, <laughs> like you thought she was just going to break down because I was rebuking the demons. Right. But that's what we're called to do. You're, you are the biggest threat to the enemy when you don't fear man, you only fear God. Amen. I'll tell you what the Lord does to the wicked. Psalm 68, 2. The power of our God. As smoke was driven away, the Bible says, just like the smoke driven away this week, so drive them yeah. away. As wa wax melts before a fire, so the wicked perish at the presence of our God. What a statement, eh? You've seen wax being melted on a fire. Man, it doesn't take long. It just starts dripping away and it's gone. That's what happens to the wicked. We don't have to worry about vengeance because vengeance is not mine. Vengeance is the Lord's and they are responsible to the Lord of heaven's armies. Amen? Amen. Exodus 33, 14 to 15. And he said, my presence will go with you. This is the Lord God speaking to Moses. I think all of you need to hear that today. Just let that sink into your spirit. That's what the Lord's saying to all of you. My presence will go with you. No matter where you go, my presence will go with you. I will give you rest. There's rest in his presence. There's not stress and anxiety and fear. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. I don't want to do anything in my own strength. I don't want to do anything in Sean Ham's ability because if I do that, I'm in trouble. But if I have God behind me, if I have the Holy Spirit that is speaking th through me, just like in front of those cameras, I tell you, it wasn't very comfortable speaking in front of 45 cameras Amen. to a bunch of demons. But when the Holy Spirit comes on you, when God fills you up with his presence, I can go anywhere that he sends me. And I don't say no to him. I'll tell you that. Because wherever he says go, I go. Yeah. Amen. Wherever he tells you to go, you go. Yeah. So often I think we look at it and we say, but God, look at all this. Right. Just like Caleb and Elijah. Did you see the giants? And God goes, yeah, of course I saw the giants, but I'm calling you to take those giants out. And so we look at all the things, all the obstacles, but we have a God that doesn't see obstacles. We have a God that sees opportunities. Yeah. I think we have the incorrect view of God so many times. Let's look at the names of God. You will be blown away by the names of God as I studied this week. The full majesty and greatness of our God. I know that many of you won't look at your circumstances the same way after you realize who God truly is. So the first name of God is El Eloi, God mighty prominent in Hebrew. Nehemiah 9.17, they refused to obey and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them, but they hardened their necks and in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. Doesn't that sound like today? <laughs> putting, our, putting our trust in a leader will bring us into bondage, but... You are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, and he did not forsake them. El also means power and might, and is associated with other qualities such as integrity. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, yeah. Yeah, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said he will not do? Or has he spoken? Will he not make it good? Integrity of our Savior. You will have people that will, that will discourage you. You will have people that will let you down. But God's word is firm. Everything that God says that will happen, will happen. His word accomplishes everything it sets out to do, and it won't return void. How many are thankful for the integrity of our Savior? With our God. He's also a jealous God. Deuteronomy 5, 8 to 10. 
You shall not make for yourself the carved image, any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. You don't hear that preached at all, do you? That God is a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon their children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commands. Amen. Nehemiah 9.31, we have a compassionate God. El also means compassionate. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them nor forsake them. For you are God, gracious and merciful. We're just getting through the beginning of all of God's names. How many are encouraged about who God is? Amen. Elohim, creator, mighty, strong. Genesis 1.1 says it all. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Chapter 1, verse 1, it says it all. God created the heavens and the earth. It speaks to the majesty and the power of Almighty God that he spoke the world into existence. By his mouth, the world was created. Yes. Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. We belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right. the maker of the world, the maker of heaven and earth, the God of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob. He speaks the world into existence. There is power and death in the life of your tongue. I was just speaking to somebody this week and I said, I gave them some correction. I said, you've got to change the way you're talking. Yeah. There's power in life in the death of your tongue. You hear people talk about they speak defeat all the time. They speak sickness over their life. They speak poverty over their life. They speak trouble over their life. Oh, I don't know why this always happens to me. I don't know why I'm struggling. How come everybody is against me? How come I don't have any money and everybody else has money? How come people are criticizing me and not criticizing him? How come they're getting married and I'm not getting married? How come they have a bigger house than I do? How come they have a bigger car than I do? And they're speaking death literally over their lives. They're speaking curses literally over their lives. We have to change the way that we speak, the way that Almighty God sees us. He sees us as heirs to the throne, brought to Him through a just relationship with Jesus Christ. We are, we are righteous through Him. Amen? Amen. Why do we look at ourselves as peasants? Why do we look at ourselves as peasants when we can come to the king? We can come to the king who has everything that we need. Everything. His name is also El Shaddai. God Almighty. Mighty one of Jacob. Genesis 49, 24. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong, strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Strength is in him, not in us. When we are weak, we are strong in him. Yahweh is Lord. And I want to, I want to make this distinction. Yahweh is Lord, capital L-O-R-D. D speaks to the amazing majesty of our Lord and Savior. He's referred to as Yahweh in the Old Testament when he's speaking to his people. Deuteronomy 6 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There are no more other gods, church. If anybody comes up to you and says, Well, we all serve the same God. Allah is the same God. Muhammad's the same God. Buddha's the same God. 
Well, I want to tell you something. It's an easy way to distinguish that because they're all dead and in the ground. And we have a Savior that rose on the third day and is still in heaven. <laughs> and he's coming back again. Amen. We don't serve the same God. Our God is alive. And well, and seated on the throne. Nothing is out of his sight. He sees everything. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Amen. Daniel 9, 14. Therefore, the Lord has kept disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord, our God, is righteous in all the works which he does. Yes. Though we have not obeyed his voice. He is righteous, though we have not obeyed his voice. Exodus 3, 14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Come on. Right. Come on. Yes. I am has sent me to you. There is something in your spirit. There's something just in my spirit just saying that I am. I am is encompassing of everything. I am creator. I am almighty. I am majestic. I am all powerful. I am over everything. I am. It speaks of the presence of God. The only one that is able to deliver us. Part of the attributes of Yahweh is forgiveness. How many are thankful for God's forgiveness? How many are thankful for a God that we can go to and ask for forgiveness? Man, I got to do that every day. I know the rest of you don't have to, but I do. <laughs> I'm teasing. I have to come to my Lord and Savior every day and ask for forgiveness. When I realize how great he is and how, my, how mighty he is and how little I am and insignificant I am, it just really gives me a different perspective of who God is. We have a God that's a God that guides us as well. Yahweh guides us. How many are thankful for the guidance of God? I remember one time we were driving in Seattle. And uh, we, were, we had a GPS. And we were with some people from our old church. And Sarah and I were driving through. And, and I was following the GPS. And, and it took me down a back alley. And Sarah said to me, where are you going? And just the way that she said it, I didn't receive the tone. And I kind of said to her, well, do you think you can do better type of thing? And there was people sitting in the back from our church, church leaders. And she grabs the GPS and she throws it on my lap. You just got to know, pastor, your pastor is by far not perfect. I'm just being real with you today. And so we were meeting with about 40 ministry leaders in Seattle, and we went to a restaurant. So I dropped her off at the door, and I went to park. And while I was in the parking lot, uh, Sarah, Sarah and the group were telling what, what had happened. The group was just talking about what had happened in the car, and they were kind of joking about it. Well, they all got together, and when I got into the restaurant, I walked through the front door of the restaurant. As soon as I walked in, they're all like, boo, boo. They gave me the cold shoulder. And I go, you guys weren't even in the car and you're blaming me. It was my fault. But how many know the guidance of God is so important because if you, go, if you get the wrong directions, which we all have with GPSs, and it sends us to the wrong place, quickly you lose your focus on God. Your greatest GPS is this right here. This will guide you. This will lead you. This will make sure that you don't go down a dark back alley. This will make sure that you get to the place you need to go to. But the problem is, is we're listening to all these other things. We're listening to people speaking. We're waiting for the next word of a prophet. To, what's the prophet going to say? What's the prophet going to say where our world's going to go? And I go, I don't care what the prophet says. I want to listen to what the Lord God Almighty says. And what he says I'm listening to. Attentive to his voice. He's also Adonai, which is used in the a lot in the by the Jews because 
They felt like calling him Lord or Yahweh was too sacred for sinful men to use. They called him Adonai. Powerful. Yet, and yet this culture minimizes the, the name of our, our Lord. Why is it okay in movies to use Jesus' Jesus's name in vain in TV shows? But why, why don't they use other gods? Why do they, why do they use Christianity? Take advantage of Christianity because it's all the brainwashed people yeah. to look at Christianity as a weak faith. Yeah. It's been happening for far too long and we've, we've allowed it to happen. We allow it in our house. Yeah. We, allow, we allow movies to blasphemy the name of Jesus in our house. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And then we go, where's the presence of the Lord? How come I can't feel God's presence? But you allow people to blasphemy Jesus Christ in your house. Yeah. Just being honest. Genesis 15, 1 to 3. After these things, the word of God came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. Your exceedingly great reward. Powerful. Yahweh Jireh. Yahweh Jireh means the Lord will provide. Genesis 22, 14. Abraham called the place the name the Lord will provide. As I said to them in this day, this is the mount where the Lord has provided. When Abraham walked up that mountain with his son Isaac and thought he was going to sacrifice his son on the altar and God provided a ram that day, he wanted to see if he was obedient. And that's what God is wanting to see from you. Will you be obedient even unto death? Will you obey God even when it's not comfortable? Because if you do, he will show himself to you in ways that you've never seen before. He will show himself faithful. He always provides. My God always provides for all of my needs. I don't have to worry about the government. I don't have to worry about the economy. I don't have to worry about who's in power. I don't have to worry about what's in my bank account. I know that my God always provides. Always. He shall supply all my needs. So many Christians are so worried all the time. I have no money. My bank account's empty. They're looking for the next job or the next big way to make a living. And it's like, man, if I just put my trust in God as my provider, Yahweh Jireh, my provider. Some of you just maybe need to speak that over your finances. And speak that in your life and say, Yahweh Jireh, you are my provider. That should encourage you today. Yahweh Rapha. Exodus 15, 26. He is the Lord who heals. And he said, if you did diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, I want you to hear this. This comes with a promise. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, Give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Powerful. Do you realize that so often, so often people get sick and what's their first response? I got to go to the doctor. I'm not feeling well. I better go to the doctor. Why do we go to the human doctor instead of going to the great physician who says he is our healer? He is Yahweh Rapha. He is the God that heals. Why don't we run to him first instead of running to the doctor? Where is our faith? Is our faith in pharmacia? I sure hope not. My faith is in the Lord who heals. Yahweh Nisi, the Lord is our banner. Even just saying that there's power that flows from that. The Holy Spirit is moving over everything. One of these names that I'm speaking, I just feel the Holy Spirit is pouring out his spirit even more. The Lord is our banner, Exodus 17, 15 to 16. And Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. For he said, the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. This became a rallying place. 
Just like the church is a rallying place. I believe the remnant is placed here at the gates of the city because the, we have said the Lord is our banner. There's nothing on the building that says that. But if you can look at our building from the outside, there's a spiritual sign that says the Lord is our banner. This is a rallying place for God's people. This is a rallying place for you believers. This is a rallying place to come together. So often believers fight the battle on their own. That's what Satan wants to do to you. What do people do when they struggle, when they're depressed, when they've had a hard week? They go into their house and they hide. And then I get a call three days later and they go, Pastor, I'm so depressed. Where were you on Sunday? I just couldn't get out of my house. It's hard. Man, it's hard. I'm not making light of that. There's some weeks where I don't want to get up, I'll be honest with you. But we're not managed by our feelings. How many know that? We can't be managed by our feelings. We have to be. We have to serve Almighty God. Right. Yahweh Mekadesh is the Lord who sanctifies. Leviticus 27 to 8. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And you shall keep my statutes and perform all of them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. He is the one that makes us holy, yes. not yes. us. Yes. Right. We position ourselves that way. We're obedient. But he's the one that makes us holy. Romans talk, the book of Romans talks about that. He sanctifies us, which means he sets us apart for his use. That's what sanctification is. Yes. Yes. We're never going to be... The goal is to be like Jesus, absolutely. The goal is to be like our Savior. We're never going to be perfect on this earth, but everything you go through, I want to tell you today, the good, the bad, the ugly, every circumstance you go to is designed to make you more like Jesus. It's to make you more like him. It's setting you apart for his use. The problem is these days is Christians are so much the same as the world that you walk into a room and you can't tell who the Christians are and who the yeah. secular people are. Because they're not set apart. We have to be different. We should be walking into a place and people should be saying, I want what he has. There is something different on him. I don't know what it is. We must be separate from the world. Why else would the world want our faith if we're just the same as the world? We fear like the world. Amen? Amen? hope this is good for you today. Good, good. Yahweh Shalom, the Lord is our peace. Is Judges 6.24. Then the Lord said to him, speaking to Gideon, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it the Lord is peace. You see, we have, we have a culture that's believing primarily in fear. But I want you to get this in your mind today. As I wrote it in my notes, it's faith over fear. Faith over fear. You should always, you want, you want to put faith at the top and then write a line underneath it and put it on your fridge and then put fear underneath. It's faith over fear. Whatever situation you're going to, whether it's the election tomorrow, whether it's your job, whether it's your business, whether it's your marriage, whether your kids, I choose faith over over fear. I choose not to look at my circumstances to define me. My circumstances don't give me joy. My circumstances don't make me happy. It doesn't matter what comes against me because I have the God of angel armies on my side. I will be happy and I will be joyful in whatever comes against me. Some of these names are really hard to pronounce. Yahweh Tiskanu. Tiskanu. The Lord is our righteousness. So great. Jeremiah 33, 16. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell in safety. And this is the name by which she shall be called. The Lord is our righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. We can't be righteous on our own. 
It's why Jesus came to become the mediator between us and God. We were separated by God because of sin in the Garden of Eden. Everybody knows the story about Adam and Eve. They were naked until they sinned, and then all of a sudden they realized they were naked. Because our Heavenly Father exposes sin in our lives, and we have to deal with it. I'll talk about that coming up. The Lord is our righteousness. Yahweh Rohi, the Lord is our shepherd. Amen? Amen. Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. But if you look at the word want, I shall not lack. I want you to get that into your spirit. The Lord is my shepherd, so I don't lack. I have everything that I need to live the life that God has called me to live. I lack nothing. I don't lack finances. I don't lack favor with men. I don't lack energy. I don't lack enthusiasm. I don't lack anything that I need because all I need is in him. Everything he has given me is in him. As long as I look at him as my shepherd and I allow him to direct me, I tell you, sometimes I need a whack with a shepherd's rod. <laughs> you guys are laughing, but you need it too. <laughs> sometimes you just need that whack. Just like a horse going off track. That bridle just keep you pull on it, just keeps them going back on track, right? Keep pulling on it, gets them back on track. We need the same thing. Sometimes God just goes whack. You're getting out of whack. You're getting out of whack. Sometimes we have to get whacked a few times before we actually get it. Isn't that the truth? Right, right. God's like, how many times do I have to do this? <laughs> Till we get it right. The rest of that scripture, verse 2 in Psalm 23. What a powerful scripture. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. I can be calm in all circumstances. I don't react with fear and anxiety when something doesn't go my way. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness. Not for my name's sake, for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I will not fear Rachel Notley. I will not fear the NDP. I will not fear the WEF. I will not fear the WHO. It doesn't matter what they're cooking up. I don't fear them because my focus is laser focused on Jesus Christ. Because if I'm not looking at Jesus, if I'm looking at all these things to determine my safety and security... What happens is I start to sink like Peter. I start to sink on the water. And the storms look bigger around me. But when I look at Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith, when I see Jesus for who he truly is, I don't have to worry about that stuff going on. Yes, I have to be aware of it. But that stuff doesn't give me joy. That stuff doesn't give me fear. Whether we have a good government or a bad government, that doesn't give me more peace because my peace is only found in Jesus Christ. Such a good scripture. Verse 4, I'm continuing. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Man, on Wednesday, that's what the Lord did. Prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint my, hair with oil, my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I'm so encouraged just reading this to you. My spirit is being lifted. I hope yours is too. Yeah. Yahweh Shammah, the Lord is there. Ezekiel 44, 1 to 4. He's talking about the temple. Then he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces towards the east, but it was shut. And the Lord said to me, this gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened and no man shall enter it because the Lord of God of Israel has entered it. Therefore, it shall be shut. As for the prince, because he is the prince, he may sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter it by the way of the vestibule, the gateway and go out the same way. Verse four, he also brought me by the way of the north to the front of the temple. And I looked and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house and I fell on my face. 
I felt on my face the majesty of our Lord. Thank you. I could hardly stand saying that. The majesty of our Lord. Yes. Holy, 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 holy. I want you just to get a mental picture right now. If Jesus were to walk through this door right here behind me. If he were to walk into this room, would you be able to sit in the chair that you're doing right now? If you just walked in, you'd be on your face. Yeah. You'd be on your face before a holy God. Yeah. That's what we need to come to church with every week. It's a reverence for the holiness of who he really is. I had somebody say to me a little while ago, they just developed this little God mentality that they think they're equal to God. And he was telling me about an analogy that God gave him. And he goes, yeah, it's like an airplane. He goes, we both fly the airplane. Jesus and I, we both fly it. And I go, no, 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 no. You're the passenger. He's the pilot. And he goes, no, no, we're, I'm equal to Jesus. That's what the Bible says. He goes, I'm equal to Jesus. And I go, no, you're not. You're nothing without Jesus. You only have the breath of God in you because God has allowed you to have that breath. And so I said to him, I said, if you're equal to Jesus, what would you do if you walked in the room right now? And he goes, I'd fall on my face. And I said, well, then you're not equal to Jesus. <laughs> you just said it, right? He's worthy to be praised. Yahweh, Sabbath. It's not Sabbath, but Sabbath. Sabbath. Sabioth. Thank you, Paul. The Lord of hosts. There, therefore, the Lord says, the Lord of hosts, Isaiah 124. Therefore, the Lord says, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, I will rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance of my enemies. Psalm 46, 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. The Lord, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Hosts means hordes. Hordes of angels. Hordes of the men of God with you. He is the Lord of hosts, which means there is an army that I've talked about many times that is bigger than you can ever ask or imagine. We serve the Lord of hosts, which means when we serve the Lord of hosts and we have the same Jesus, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead that lives in us, we have an army that walks with us. Yes. We're never alone. I remember walking into the hospital when COVID was going on and I was one of the only people out in the hospital. I remember walking through the dark hallways and the Lord gave me a vision one time. I was walking through, I'll never forget it. It was right close to the gift shop when you're walking through. And I was heavy praying for people. As I'm walking through, I felt so alone, unvaccinated in, in the hospital, flying under the radar. I felt so alone, but then the Lord gave me this vision. And as I was walking, I just felt like there were angels walking with me. And everywhere I looked, there was angels beside me, angels in front of me, angels behind me. So when I walked into that ward that day, I didn't walk in with my shoulders slumped. I walked in like, I'm here with the God of angel armies. God is with me. I have nothing to fear. Thank you, Jesus. El Elohim. Deuteronomy 6, 26, 19, which is most high. And he will set you high above the nations which he has made in praise, in name, in honor, that you may be a holy people to your Lord just as he has spoken. It speaks of the lordship to God. I've talked about the lordship of God. All of our, our, all of our lives should fall under his lordship, everything. Lord means he's lord of your money, where your money goes, He's Lord of your marriage. He's Lord of who you marry, if you're single. He's Lord over your relationships. He's Lord what you do with your time. He's Lord over your career. He's Lord over every decision that you make. Because guess what happens then? When he is Lord, you're not making your own decisions. You're making decisions that align with him. And then you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry whether people approve you. People may call you crazy. 
Why are you doing this? This is crazy. But if it aligns with the Bible, if it aligns with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, then we know we're headed in the right direction. Amen. He is the Most High. El Roy He. This is a good one. I want you to hear this one. El Roy He, the God that sees. Mm -hmm. Do some of you feel like God, God doesn't see sometimes? I know that's probably true. Do you feel like that God doesn't see your circumstances sometimes? Or do you, do you feel like God's not seeing the wickedness that's in the society sometimes? Does God see? Genesis 16, 13 to 14. This is talking about Hagar when she was in the wilderness after being driven out by Sarah. And when Hagar met the angel of the Lord, she recognized that she had seen the manifestation of God himself. Verse 13, she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees, for she said. Have I also seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called, and this is the only time where beer is mentioned. <laughs> beer, Lahai, Roy, Observed is between Kadesh and Barad. He is the God that sees. I want to tell you today, some of you feel like God doesn't see everything. He sees your hurt today. He sees your tears today. He sees your frustration today. He sees all of your challenges today. He sees every disappointment that you have today. But my life is in his hands. I have to have faith to say, Regardless of what's coming against me, regardless of everything that looks like it's coming against me, my faith is built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. I have a foundation that's built on God's word. And when that storm comes, when that hurricane comes, it can beat against the house and knock against the house. But I'm going to tell you something, the house will stand through everything because your hope is in Jesus. Your hope is not in your circumstances. I think some of us get so lost in our circumstances, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Things happen and we're just like, why is this happening? But God doesn't want us to look at our circumstances. We've got to look to him. How many are blown away by all the names of God today? Yeah. Did you all know there's this many names of God? El Olam, everlasting God. Psalm 91 to 3. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men. El Gibor, mighty God. Isaiah 9 and 6, speaking of Jesus Christ. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Amen. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. The name describing our Messiah, Jesus Christ, the mighty warrior, the warrior of all warriors. I want to wrap up today. With the holiness is for you, church. We talked about the holiness of God. Holiness is for you. Holiness is for me. It's conforming to the character of God. I don't know if you have this, Nathan, but my parents used to bring me to church. There's, there I am going to church. Same what? <laughs> yeah, lots of hair. I had to wear a tie every week and a dress shirt. Um, I had to wear a suit. A lot of times my parents dressed me in a three-piece suit. And that's how we went to church every week. Because my parents, it was important to them, not, not out of uh, dressing a certain way, but out of a reverence for the Lord. And how many know we've lost a reverence for the Lord in church? My parents would bring us early. We would go early to church and... My dad would go to the store before we went to church and he'd buy mints for his breath. <laughs> and he'd fill his pockets with mints and then he'd be sitting there and he'd be taking mints out during the service and the mints would fall on the floor. <laughs> I may have eaten a few mints off the floor. And I'm still here walking and living. 
We would walk into church always early to meet with people. Not much has changed with us. I remember the sound of the wooden floors walking into church. We would sing hymns out of the hymn books. There was a reverence for a holy God. People would walk in and it would just be a quiet reverence for the Lord. We've come to a place in this generation where people saunter in late all the time. Did he just say that? Yes, I just said that. (laughs) We make excuses for being late for church, don't we? But the same people wouldn't be late for a hockey game that they paid $200 for. In fact, they would be early to the hockey game. The same people wouldn't be late for a concert that they paid to. Why? Because they'd make sure they get to Calgary early so they can have supper and get to the concert and get parked early. I'm speaking to the choir, aren't I? (laughs) Just being real. Do you know why that is? It's because most people don't have a worship life on their own. They depend on Sundays alone. And so they go through their week. And what what, what it says to me is when it's continual habitual lateness where some people come in 15 minutes late. They come in and then they leave and they go, I don't feel any different. And I think, well, yeah, you have not prepared yourself to be in the presence of a holy God. I think you need to just keep remembering that if Jesus walked through, how would I be, how would I come to the service? If Jesus was coming to church, like last week, Josh Alexander is here, so people came early. Wanted to get a seat, didn't want to miss it. But Jesus is here every week. Why don't we come early to get a seat for Jesus? I'm preaching this today. It's true. We can't depend on Sundays alone. Many people get up and spend time on Facebook right away. Check and see how many notifications they got. Did people like my video? Did people like my page? They get into a scrap with their spouse before they come to church. And they wonder why they can't feel the presence of the Lord. I want to give you a couple of scriptures that you can use to prepare yourselves on Sunday mornings to come into the holy presence of our God. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. What a beautiful thing. The one thing I desire is to be in the presence of God and his people. This last three years has showed that church attendance in a lot of places is down because people got used to online church. But how many know it's not the same as the real thing? We need community. We can experience God wherever we are. But God needs you to be in community with other believers. Otherwise, Satan will take you out. Psalm 51, 10 to 12, it's right on the wall there. It might be even right be left to, to the left of Brent there. Psalm 51, 10 to 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I say this all the time when I'm driving by myself. Constantly, Lord, is my heart right with you? Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. This is my part. We talked about a holy God. This is our part. In coming to a holy God. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Some of you have to have that joy of your first day of salvation. Remember when you got saved? Remember the day you got saved and what God did in your life and you were so excited? You've lost your first love. You've got to ask the Lord to bring back the joy of your salvation, the joy of being in his presence, the joy of being with the Lord. Our God, a holy God, does not deserve our leftovers. He deserves our best. He does not deserve table scraps. Here are some things that you can do to prepare yourself when you come to church to worship a holy God. I'm going to give you, I feel like I'm, I guess I am talking to to children sometimes. Just being honest. God has to discipline us like children, doesn't he? Yeah. Get to bed early on Saturday night. <laughs> yes. Some of you are laughing because I know you've been up a long time. You walk in with these big bags under your eyes. 
Get to bed Saturday night early. Instead of staying up watching TV late, how about getting to God's word 30 minutes before you yes. get to bed? Yes. How about having the presence of God on you before the last thing you do before you close your eyes, having the word of God on your spirit? Yes. Play worship music in your home before you go to bed instead of secular TV. It puts you in an atmosphere of worship before you even come to church the next morning. Amen. Get up early on Sunday morning, not rushed. I get up between 5.30 and 6 on Sunday morning. Service doesn't start till 9. I get up early because I want to prepare my spirit. I don't want to be in a rush. I want to spend time before a holy God. I read my devotions this morning, even before I speak the message. I need to read my devotions, and so do you on a Sunday morning. Yeah. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. It gets you out of your selfishness. Instead of saying... What, what can the church do for me today? Say, what can I do for the church? Say, Holy Spirit, what do you have planned for me today? How are you going to use me to impact people's lives for the kingdom today? What are you going to put in front of me today? Holy Spirit, lead, lead me and guide me. This is helpful, isn't it? Read your Bible first thing in the morning. It says, God, you're first in my life over everything. Spend time in prayer first thing in the morning. Ask the Lord to open up your heart and worship him. And then pray, say, Lord, help me to receive the word that's coming this morning. Help me to not be distracted with everything that I have going. Help me to have a clear conscience to receive from you. And search my heart. You need to ask the Lord to search your heart every time you come to church. If there's anything in me that's not of you, help me to recognize it and repent. You need to look in the mirror, church. You look in the mirror to get ready before you come here. But you need to look in the spiritual mirror and say, is there anything wicked in my life? Is there any unconfessed sin? Is there anything in my life that's not honoring to God? Amen? Amen. Don't settle for mediocrity. God has created you for so much more. It's like drinking water out of the streams of the mountains. The freshest water in the world is in the mountains. It's so pure. But if you drink that water going down the streams, you'll get sick because there's still impurities into it. What do you need to do to make sure that you're getting the best water? It needs to go through a filter. And so I want to tell you today, everything that you're doing in your life needs to go through a filter. It needs to be purified through a filter of God's word. It needs to be purified through a filter of the Holy Spirit. It needs to be a filter through everything that God is speaking to you. Don't let it be, don't let anything get into your life. Don't let any junk get into your life. Put it through the filter of God so the water is pure. It must be the standard of everything in our lives. It, everything we do must go through the filter of God's word. So I got some questions for you today as we, as we close here. Are you choosing the world today as your joy? Or do you find joy in the presence of the Lord? I don't know about you, but I found joy today. Joy in worship, joy in God's word, joy in hearing the 17 names of God today. Will you seek him and desire him above all else? Like water in a desert. I need the living water. You need the living water that only Jesus can offer. Otherwise, you're just like the woman at the well that just keeps coming back. I just need more water. I just need more water. And Jesus is saying, if you only knew the living water that I have, you wouldn't keep coming back for this water because the water that I give you, you will never thirst Again, you will not look for fulfillment in every other part of life. You will look only for fulfillment in Jesus Christ. You won't be thirsty again, church. You won't be looking for things to fill that need. It won't be a boyfriend or a girlfriend that will fill that need. It won't be money. It won't be fame. It won't be recognition or validation. It won't be a career or a business. It won't be sex. It won't be lust. It won't be pornography. It won't be entertainment. It won't be sports. It won't be traveling. The only thing that will fulfill you is Jesus Christ our Lord.
I choose to be holy. Say that, church. Set apart for you, Lord. Ready to do your will. It's refiner's fire. We serve a God that is so amazing. He's mighty. He's strong. He's prominent. He's integrity. He's jealous. Compassionate. Creator. Almighty. Lord. Forgiving. Guiding, provider, healer, banner, sanctifier, peace, righteousness, shepherd. Present, his presence is with us. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the most high. He sees everything. He is the everlasting mighty God. He is majestic. He is the God that is worthy of all of our praise. He is the God that we can't help but worship today, church. And so I want you to come into a spirit of, of praise right now. I want you to prepare your spirits today. We're going to sing a song. That's an older song as, as I was preparing this week. It's funny how the Holy Spirit works. I was preparing in this, the old song that I sang all those years ago in, in Bible school in this old barn in Saskatchewan. Refiner's fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy. Set apart for you, my master. Ready to do your will. Would you stand to your feet and sing that song with us today? Thank you, Jesus.
for this moment today. We thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would empower us to live a life that would be holy unto you. Father, help us to be holy as you are holy. Lord, I pray that we would, we would leave this place different than what we came. I pray that we would apply, Lord, the greatness of our God to every single situation that we're in. I pray that we would speak Jesus over every situation that we're in. Father, may we not walk with our heads down and walk in a place of frustration or bitterness or unforgiveness or apathy or depression or whatever it is, Lord. May we look to you. May we look to you. The God who breathed this world into existence is the God that can do the impossible. Yeah. With man, it looks impossible, but with our God, it, it is possible. He yeah. can do all things yeah. through, through Christ who gives us strength in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to bless you today. Before we go, so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, the name that is above every other name. Amen. You are not dismissed. If you are dismissed, it means you can sit on the couch and be the same. You are sent to go make a difference in the kingdom of God. Amen. Love you, church. See you next week.